All right, so it has been a long time since I did a philosophy or psychology or film uh, video on my channel. And so those of you who have been with me a while, if you're not pretty new to my channel, you know that I used to do more of these videos where I would talk about something that interested me in uh, philosophy, psychology, sometimes the Bible, sometimes uh, film, sometimes literature. And that's because I used to be a college teacher. I don't like to say professor because I was never tenure or tenure track, but I was a full-time college lecturer for a while. And uh, for, well, for many years actually. And so I, uh, I love talking about, I, I taught English and I, talk, I, I taught a number of different things under the umbrella of English, but like a lot of literature classes, a lot of writing classes and, um, and stuff even kind of like off the grid, a lot of film, you know, anyway. I, uh, I used to do more videos on these types of subjects and there are some of my followers and some of my you know subscribers and supporters who love these videos and that's why they actually stick around they don't you know some of my subscribers in fact some of my biggest fans they don't really like the celebrity stuff as much I mean and they understand that the Marilyn Manson stuff is important and the Me Too stuff and Johnny Depp and all of that but there are a number of people who are some of my biggest fans and they they really appreciate mostly the videos that I'm about to do. I don't do them very often uh, because they don't, you know, just to be quite honest, they don't get nearly the views that the other the other videos get. And unfortunately the game with the YouTube algorithm, and it's pretty frustrating at times, honestly, but the game with the new the YouTube algorithm is that the YouTube algorithm, yes, it does tend to reward more celebrity focused content, more controversial content, um, more, you know, clickbaity stuff, right? And, you know, and I do that, I, I do that kind of stuff on my channel, but of course I, I always am trying behind that and trying to advocate a cause that I think is just or that's important or whatever, right? So you have to do these things to sort of get people's attention. You have to have, or I have to have the sort of crass, vulgar thumbnails, you know, like I know my thumbnails are not sophisticated works of art, right? My thumbnail images. And you have to have the titles, you know, the clickbaity titles and all that. But, um, but I hope I do have the content behind that, behind those titles and the, the sort of vulgar thumbnails. My point is though, YouTubers use those things for a reason because, and, and they cover the things that they cover for a reason, not just because we, we are passionate about some of these controversial topics and these celebrity Me Too controversies and everything, but also, you know, because they do get the, pushed really hard by the YouTube algorithm. And when they are pushed hard, also, you know, more people tend to click on that stuff. You know, I, I'm the same way. I'm more likely to click on a celebrity controversy video than a video about philosophy or about literature or whatever. And I used to teach those things. So I totally get it. It's not like, uh, I'm not criticizing anyone's taste, but that's why I don't make these very often because, you know, just quite frankly, they're not very profitable for me in any way. And not, not in terms of money, but also not in terms of like, you know, expanding my, my reach on YouTube and, and keeping me popular in the algorithm. So I have though not made a video like this lately because I've just been so inundated with the Marilyn Manson stuff. You know, I feel like things were kind of more or less kind of dead with the Manson case, except for the occasional lawsuit or when he filed the defamation and reckless conduct suit against Evan and Illman, all that. I felt like, you know, other than those occasional blips of activity, or when the documentary came out on HBO, other than those occasional blips of activity, I felt like, you know, for like two years, it almost been kind of dead. And uh, then all of a sudden, you know, just starts picking up with, uh, with, you know, things heating up with the Manson case and with the recent revelations and everything. So I have been covering that a lot. And uh, so anyway, I haven't done this in a while. And so I want to get back into it. I, you know, I don't just want to be known for the Marilyn Manson content, even though I think that's a huge story. I think it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger. You know, even Candace Owens is, is covering it now. You know, we have big people looking into it. Thank God. Uh, but, you know, still, um, that's good. That's always going to be a huge thing on my channel. And it's always good. And, and until that case is over, it's good. It's still going to be the main focus of my channel. And so I'm not in any way moving away from that, believe me, because I think it's just going to actually become bigger but I but I do want to kind of get back to sort of more of the balance that I had on my channel you know in like um, in November or you know in December before things really started heating up uh, with the Manson stuff so 
my goal is to put out several, you know, philosophy videos and stuff as I can and to start putting on, on YouTube and then start putting more of these types of uh, videos, uh, philosophy, you know, literature, film, whatever, on my Patreon. And I do, if you like this sort of thing and you haven't joined my Patreon, I do have uh, quite a nice, like, sort of backlog now or, or library of uh, different videos on different topics in these realms that I haven't put online publicly. Now I haven't done this and I haven't done this in a while on Patreon. Um, I've been I've been really lagging there and people are nice to have stuck with me. I guess sticking with me because they know I've been really involved with the Manson thing and getting you know the word out and, and providing coverage and just keeping up with all the developments. But I'm gonna get back to this. So today I wanted to talk about this is what I'm gonna do. Today I want to talk about the book of Job in the Bible. And one of the things that I like to do on my channel when I do tackle some of the philosophy stuff or some of the literature or film or whatever, um, I like to, I do like to talk about the Bible at times. So I was raised in a Christian home and uh, sort of traditional East Texas Southern Baptist, right? And I read, you know, read the Bible a lot, studied the Bible a lot. And even though my views now have uh, drifted away from that, or I, I'm really not sure, you know, what I believe. And I did a long video on my beliefs such as they are. You can check it out um, on my, um, on one of my playlists. But my point is, I have a lot of appreciation for Christianity. I know it's got its downsides, and I know the, the institution of the Christian church has, and, and the wars and all the conflict. I like, I know the same history you all know, right? And I, and I get fed up with the same stuff a lot of you get fed up with, right? It's particularly from, you know, modern modern some modern day really extreme you know angry christians but that isn't representative of all or of, of the whole and i think that there's a lot of really there are a lot of really interesting deep uh life lessons or just life ideas in the bible just like there are in shakespeare and and i think the you know even the atheist can get a lot from it so i give that little spiel here this this little introduction for those people who might be new to my channel and are wondering like, okay, I, I came here for the, the Marilyn Manson controversy coverage and like, now what are you doing? You're giving a sermon. So anyway, you know, I don't know what you call it. A lecture, you know, like I used to teach this stuff in, in college. So we're gonna look at Job and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about some of it here and then I'm gonna put some of this on my Patreon. Uh, again, I haven't been doing much Patreon stuff. I want to make it up to the, my, my patrons. And so you can check me out on Patreon. I've got different levels of membership. And uh, the cheapest one is three bucks a month. But let's talk about Job. Now, why am I interested in Job? First of all, let me just say I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not an expert or anything like that. I'm not, you know, and like now in my life, I'm not a religious person or anything. Um, but I, I do think just as a work of literature, just as something that we can just kind of discuss right now, I think it's, I think it is one of the most interesting books of the Bible. And quite frankly, the reason why I'm thinking of it right now, honestly, is this picture a little bit crooked? It might be just a little bit. It drives, I know it drives some people nuts, particularly OCD. Uh oh, there it is. Oh, stay. This light is a bit bright too. I'm still figuring things out with my, uh, with my setup, but have new equipment just waiting for one or two connectors and then uh, I think we're going to be finally there or where I want to be. A new camera and everything setting up this week. Um, okay, so quite frankly the reason why I'm coming to this, why I'm talking about this, is because this, this is going to sound kind of strange maybe, but this Marilyn Manson situation really has made me think about the book of Job. And you may say, well, that's silly. You know, Marilyn Manson is not, uh, first of all, you could say he's brought some of this upon himself. You know, Job in the Bible is this person who's depicted as being like basically like entirely blameless and like almost like a perfect human being or whatever. When God, in fact, he's so exemplary, right, that that's kind of a part of the story is that like he's being he's being tested to see if that exemplary, you know, um, uh, moral rectitude and, and obedience to God and all that will be maintained even throughout all this suffering. Right. Whereas Manson, I don't think, you know, I don't think we can say that he's been a perfect human being. I don't think he would say that either. LOL, cow. Um, so. No, that's not what I'm thinking of. And you might say too, well, Marilyn Manson, uh, he is not, you know, he's, he's had some bad breaks the last couple of years and yeah, he's been canceled and 
things aren't nice, things aren't great for him, but he's not enduring the level of affliction that Job endured. You know, Job had, you know, all his, ki his kids were killed and he lost all of, of his wealth and he became afflicted with some kind of awful disease where he developed all of these boils over his body and it said in the Bible that, you know, the boils are so bad that he's got to get this like piece of pottery and like scrape them off and stuff. Now, again, I'm looking at this as a work of literature. I'm not saying that I believe these things actually happened or whatever. You know, I, I don't I don't want to be in that realm of debate because that's not the point of uh, this video. Right. So I want people who are Christians and totally believe this as like fact, as something that happened or, you know, whatever. I want them in, in Christians. Well, and also it's in the Hebrew Bible. Right. So, uh, you know, wh whomever Christians or Jews believe this to be like actual something that happened. Great. What can we take from it? Or if you're an atheist or you're non-Christian or whatever, Great. What can we take from it? Okay. Just like, what can we take from Shakespeare? So my point is though, what I was saying is that Marilyn Manson, of course, he's not enduring that level of affliction. So I understand these two objections. All right. And I'm not saying it's a perfect fit. And that's not the point of my argument. I'm <laughs> of, of what I'm saying here. I'm actually not interested in talking about Marilyn Manson anymore, but I'm just saying uh, in this video, and I'm just saying though that, uh, that that's where I got the idea, where I, where I started thinking about Job again, really seriously. And there, there are just a few things I want to say right off the bat. So first of all, I think that Job has, and, and this is not some great revelation, right? This is something that, you know, basic scholarship on, on Job has discussed. But it is one of those places in the Bible where we get perhaps the, the most uh, serious or sophisticated critique of God himself. And by the way, when I, when I gender God, that's just because that's what I'm most comfortable with having grown up that way. And even though, you know, I, I don't have those beliefs anymore, really don't know what I, I believe, I, um, I still, you know, I still refer to God as a he, but I think God is genderless and I think anybody with like a brain would understand that, that if there's a God, it's not, a, it's not a male. Okay. And it's not a female. Uh, but anyway, what was I even talking about? So, oh, this, so this book of the Bible, uh, the, the book of Job, it represents probably the strongest and most sophisticated critique of God in the Bible. And the, and in the sense that this suffering of Job seems to be entirely pointless, right? It's, it's entirely without explanation. He's, you know, it's popular in, uh, in the Hebrew Bible or in the Old Testament to see this, this kind of equation metaphorically being used where, it, you know, if uh, sort of eye for an eye, or if you do something wrong, then God will punish you for that, right? It's sort of like this, you know, retributive thing. So someone is sinful, God will punish them, right? And, you know, even going back to like idea of Sodom and Gomorrah that had to be annihilated because they were so deep into their sin. And so, um, and I'm not saying that was like a good story or a good thing or whatever. I, I find that disturbing, but that's a topic for another time, another video. No, but what I'm saying is though, in Job, that is, that is undermined or that, that's completely tossed out, right? And so we, we, what we see here is basically a very, very good man, according to the story, a very, very good man being persecuted by God or by an agent of God. Really, it seems, at least the way it's presented initially, as a, as a kind of a bet. It really, you know, and we'll get into this in a second, but it's really interesting to be able to look at, to read through this, particularly at the beginning of the book, where basically you've got God, you know, who's sort of chilling up in heaven or wherever in another realm. And then you've got someone who's referred to as the adversary. Now, some people have liked to, uh, some people believe that this is actually Satan, so that the Satan of, the, of Christianity, right, appears and starts talking to God. There are other perspectives, though, that I tend to think are more valid, that this is not like the same Satan that we see referenced in other parts of the Bible and in the New Testament. But in fact, this is like an agent of God. This is like someone doing, and this is, this is an interpretation you find in a lot of the scholarship too, right? Is that this is someone who's actually sort of God's agent and is sort of carrying out God's will. And they call him the adversary, like you would call a prosecutor, right? The prosecutor works for the state and is scaring, carrying out the state's will. But the, the job of the prosecutor is to actually target citizens of the state who are out of line. 
And in this case, they're not targeting someone who's out of line. They're targeting someone who's actually, who's actually an, exem an exemplar of a good man. And they seem to be doing it, at least at first glance, and I'm going to get into it more deeply, but they seem to be doing it almost as a kind of, a, of an experiment. I don't know, a bet, but more of an experiment. And I'll get into that in a moment. I'm going to read through the text on my Patreon. But I'm giving you, I want to give you the story right now, or at least the beginning of the story and some of the things that I find interesting in this. So, so then what happens in the story is that God's chilling out wherever God is and the adversary appears and God says to the adversary, he says, um, well, what you been up to basically, or give me a report, <laughs> right? That's the story. Give me a report. Tell me what's going on. And, uh, and the adversary says, well, yeah, I've just been exploring, you know, the different realms, your different realms, just seeing what's going on. And uh, listen, this is interesting. There's this guy, Job. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. In the story, actually, let me, let me, let me revise that. Okay. The God, the Lord, is the one who points out Job to the adversary, right? And so the adversary is like, yeah, I've just been like going around and checking out different stuff. And God says to the adversary, he says, uh, have you noticed my man Job over here? He, man, he is such a, he's such a great man. And the adversary says to him, says to him, well, of course he's a great man. He has, you, you've completely blessed him in all these different ways, right? So he's blessed in all the ways that someone could be blessed. He's got a great family, a big family. Uh, he's got a loyal wife. He's got, you know, all these um, uh, cattle and all this money and this esteem and everything's great in his life. But you take some of that away or you afflict him with, with tragedy and you see he will turn on you. This is what the adversary says to God. You see he will turn on you. He will turn on you. And so God basically authorizes this adversary, says, okay, go ahead and afflict him. And there's sort of different rounds of affliction or targeting or persecution that occur. So not everything is taken away from Job all at once. And if you look into the story, you know, there are, there are sort of uh, different levels of it or, or different sort of steps in the process. But eventually what happens is that God allows and not just allows, but directs the adversary to take Job's children and to take his wealth and to take his health so that he is reduced to the position of what I was just saying earlier with the painful boils all over the body. According to the book, uh, according to the Bible, it says that uh, it said that his friends couldn't even recognize him, I guess, because he was so, you know, messed up looking. Now, what then happens in this in this book is that um, Job refuses to to curse God. He refuses to turn against God. He refuses to, you know, kill himself or to end things. And even despite his great sorrow and anguish and also his clear frustration with God, and you could say anger or in bewilderment, whatever term you want to use, with God for allowing these afflictions, right? So even as he remains, remains finally, you know, loyal and faithful to God, according to this story, and uh, at the same time, uh, he, does, he does voice these critiques. And so this is why I was saying this is one place in the Bible you could say maybe the place in the Bible where we have the strongest and most sophisticated and legitimized critiques of, of God because they come from a, a, a very good man, a noble man. They don't come from some wicked pharaoh who's enslaving a bunch of Israelites or whatever, right? Or some, you know, just blatant heathen disbelievers or whatever. But they come from a very good man. And, and what he, over the course of various chapters of this book, what he and what others, what his friend, uh, not what he, I'm sorry, <laughs> what he and what many others of us, you know, over thousands of years, right, have, have voiced the same thing, which is, God, what is the point of seemingly pointless suffering? And there's actually a term for this. Some of you are familiar with, you know, basic sort of theology or religious studies uh, may have heard this before. The term is theodicy. Not the Odyssey, but like theo, like theological, right? Theodicy. And basically what the term indicates is the challenge that, uh, that, that religious people and Christians and scholars, and not, well, not just Christians, really anyone who believes in, in a good God, the challenge that they have, that we have in reconciling the fact 
that God, on the one hand, we would like to think that God is 100% good, totally benevolent. God is, is, is all good, all loving, all of that, right? And also, we would like to think that God is all-powerful, that God is omnipotent, you know, all-knowing, all-present, and all of that, right? And yet, the presence of evil, the presence of suffering, that seems to stand in stark contradiction to those ideas, right? Because, and this is the sort of equation and the paradox that those interested in the, in the theodicy are interested in, is that if God is all powerful and if God is all good, then it, suffering is hard to explain, right? Because if God can do anything that he wants, and if he wants nothing but good for people, then it should be easy to eradicate suffering or to not have suffering or to not have evil or whatever, right? And so can he, there's got to be something missing, right? He, he, either he is all good, he does want everything to be good, but he's just not quite able to engineer things that way or work things out that way or whatever, so is he really all powerful? Or he's all powerful, but his first priority is not always our own happiness or, or, or even uh, his priority is not always that we avoid terrible, horrible suffering and evil. There must be some part of him right? That um, in some way uh, endorses suffering or evil or endorses its presence in the world. And, I, and that's what we see in Job, right? Is that we have this really good man here and God acknowledges, and that's, the, that's what's so sort of like, wow, that this book is even in the Bible, first of all, you know, and of course that's a whole other topic sometime of like how the books that are in the Bible came to be in there and all of that. But uh, and probably I'm not a Bible scholar, so it's probably something I'll never get into on, on the channel. But I'm just saying, though. But what a, what an interesting thing to to have in here, and this is why it's Job is felt to be one of the the most sophisticated critique of God in the Bible is because it points out that very paradox. This is grappling with the paradox, the questions of the theodicy. It's an attempt to make sense of this of the fact that uh, that suffering and evil are something that even so even the best men and women in the world still have to deal with and sometimes they have to deal with way more you know there's not this easy equivalence between uh between oh someone does some bad things and and then we know that they're going to get their punishment you know um I have not been following the Alex Murdoch trial at uh, at all. I've barely followed the case. I've watched a couple of uh, parts of some documentaries, and I've read some Daily Mail articles. And so I don't want to. Uh, I'm not advocating his innocence, but I'm, I'm just I don't want to wade into that debate or that argument. But I will say that if what people are saying about him and these documentaries are indicating, and if what the verdict indicates, if that's really true, if he really is guilty and he did these things, you know. Um, that's definitely a case then of someone whose who's bad deeds do catch up with them, right? Uh, and I, I do think often in life there is actually a kind of a karma, but no, not always. And, and the point is too, does anyone, does any, well, I shouldn't say that right after I brought up Alex Murdahl, but it's very complicated to assign ultimate moral culpability to people because we did not create ourselves we did not create our brains, we did not create our biology, and we did not create the environment in which we were raised or grew up or the culture we're in. And these are the things that determine our behavior. Now, it's true, I, I believe actually in my own religious or spiritual beliefs, I do believe actually in a, in a kind of a soul, um, but uh, that, that that is a component of our behavior perhaps. But, uh, but I mean, the idea of free will, that is a big pickle, and I think that everyone would have to concede that a large, large part of our behavior, if not all of it, is, is deterministic. It's determined by factors beyond our control. You didn't choose your parents, you didn't choose your upbringing, you didn't choose your past traumas, you didn't choose um, the good or the bad things that's ha that have happened to you, you didn't choose... Um, you didn't choose your, your biology, your brain, all of that. Now, you might say, but no, that's not right. I made decisions to put me in this place or in this place. I absolutely agree, and I, ab and I think that we absolutely cannot live as if we don't have free will because I think that's, a, that's just psychologically speaking and ethically speaking, it's just kind of disastrous, right? 
but I am saying that sort of like alt, and so I, I'm not saying that people, you know, on this earth are not responsible for what they do or Alex Murdoch shouldn't go to jail because he's the way he is because of how he was raised. Although that documentary did make a really strong case for that that I saw. But again, I'm not saying that he should not have to face consequences. Like we just can't have people not facing consequences and not believing that you have the power to change. It, that's not a good, that's not a good frame of mind and it's not helpful. But I am just saying, like, ultimately, in, like, the ultimate, ultimate sense of moral culpability, I, I think, I, I don't know, that's a thorny issue. And so I guess what I'm saying is even the idea that if someone does something bad, that it's, it's great that they should have to feel suffering, right, themselves, I, I find that even complicated because I'm not sure, you know, in terms of a larger spiritual sense where ultimate culpability really lies. I think, you know, a lot of culpability lies with God. You know, if, if there is one who set all this in motion. But anyway, my point is these are all things that are actually to some degree or other grappled with in the book of Job. If you read it very closely and you look into it, right? I'm not saying they had a clear sense of like biological or, you know, uh, sociocultural determinism or whatever. But I'm just saying like there is a real grappling with like God ultimately, what is the point of all this? Not just what is the point of what's going on in my life, where I, I, from Job's perspective, I feel like you're persecuting me and it seems like pointless suffering, but like you look around and you see like, you know, and the whole thing, like what is up with all this? And you find, you know, a, a similar ideas in the book of Ecclesiastes, which I've talked about before. I've, it's probably one of the most depressing things that you could ever read. Um, I know people try to pick out things that sort of redeem it for them, you know, like, well, it gives you some comfort here, or in the end, it's, you know, it's just about just sort of leaving it all up to God or whatever and doing what God tells you. I get all of that. I get all of that. But like, that's a real downer of a, of a book still, because Ecclesiastes, it really just sort of shreds up anything in life, ultimately, that we might find to have meaning and sort of says also, not only that, but just look how hard life is. Look at how difficult, look at how much suffering there is in all of that. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense. So I guess what I'm saying is it's very interesting that we have this book that is an examination of a, a good man, a very good man being persecuted by God or by God's agent, right? And that there's no easy answer. And you know what's interesting is that if you, if you, if you read through the book of Job, an answer is never provided. It's not. It's not provided. Um, so, and I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how the book ends up. Okay, and I, I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about what I think some of the overall meaning is. But there is one other really interesting thing that I want to bring up that I think very little attention or not enough attention is given to when people talk about this book. So when things get really really bad for Job, and he loses all of his children, and he loses all of his wealth, and he loses his health, and basically, I mean, things are just as bad as they could be. His wife says to him, and this is a really famous verse in the Bible, a really famous quote, and there's different paraphrasings of it and stuff. So, I mean, I'm giving you a paraphrasing, but uh, she says, uh, she says, curse God and die. <laughs> now, I don't know if I should be laughing, but I'm just, <laughs> this is some really strong shit is what I'm saying. Okay. You know how I was just telling you that the book of Job, that one of the things that's interesting about it is that it is one of the uh, one of the strongest and most sophisticated critiques of God, and, and, and critiques in the sense of like I, this doesn't make sense. What's going on here? You know, the idea of, of the ultimate questions of the theodicy, right? Um, but this quote where his wife says she sort of like evaluates the situation. You know, she sees he's going through all this pain. She's just lost all of her children. I mean, y'all. I mean, come on, like that in of itself, right? She's lost everything just like him, and, and she's seeing him continue to suffer, and she's seeing him not only continue to suffer, but continue to try to, like, keep believing in God, and keep believing in God's goodness, and, and he's, he's, he's trying to maintain a kind of an openness to the fact that despite all of the suffering that he is enduring, that there still could, that there still is some ultimate like meaning or some ultimate way in which it, it makes sense or it can be redeemed or, or whatever, right? These things that we look for and ask ourselves all the time in life when we're going through really difficult stuff. So here he is, he's fighting that battle. Job is fighting that. You can just see it in the verses too. He's just fighting that battle to like, you know, because he's getting hit after hit after hit after hit. 
and he's just he's just like he's just trying to hold it together and trying not to not to fall apart and also like not to you know not to say screw it and not to say screw god and not to say you know to hell with all this and kill himself i don't know right he's still trying to stay in the game you know it's like tom brady out there well not anymore I was actually, let me just say as an aside, I actually was really sad to see Tom Brady retire. Um, just because, I, I don't know, I just think it's kind of sad, everything that's happened over the past year. And, you know, if he was going to retire, then he could have retired a year earlier, you know, and maybe his family would have stayed together. But also, if you've watched my coverage of this, I actually did a video on this. I'm not like Team Giselle or anything. I think that... I'm very perplexed by the by the fact that there was not some way in which Giselle and Tom Brady could work it out so that they could stay together and and make things better for her. I mean, better for her. Doesn't she already have like an amazing life? I don't know. But anyway, make things more to her liking, but also so that the guy could continue to do what obviously is the greatest passion for him. I mean, Giselle has even said it. She said it in interviews years ago that she had never met anyone who loved anything the way that Tom loves football. Well, why did he have to totally give that up? I get that he wasn't home, you know, at times, but like, you know, there are a lot of like normal men who are not home, you know, even more or, or, or able to spend even less time with their families and stuff. I just, I don't know. I just, that whole situation, I just feel bad for how it turned out. And I feel like I'm not team Tom or whatever, but like, I just, I don't know. I'll have to talk about that later. God, was I trying to compare Tom Brady to Job or how do we get off on this? <laughs> Um, no, okay, so I was talking about, I know, husbands and wives. Well, anyway, so Job is going through all this, and his wife is seeing all this, and he's trying to hold it together and everything, and she says, curse God and die. So she tells him to do the very thing that he is, like, fighting his hardest not to do. He's taking hit after hit after hit, and he's trying to be positive, and whatever that means, you know, and, and not, not turn on God. And she just flat out says, curse God, you know, and cursing, I mean, we understand what this means, right? God. And uh, if you, if you weren't watching, then you don't know what I just did, but I just gave the finger to the camera. I'm trying to illustrate the idea of someone cursing God. All right. So that's what she says to do, you know, curse God and then die. I don't know. Die is in like kill yourself or die is in, um, as in like, uh, you know, maybe God's going to punish you because you've just cursed him or whatever, right? But basically, like, she, it's like a complete sort of relinquishing of any hope or any, uh, and, and there's absolutely no acknowledgement that there could be any reason to any of this or anything worth continuing to have a good attitude for or continuing or any God worthy of having faith in any of that. This, like, this, this statement, um, uh, curse God and die. It's a complete rejection and a complete resignation. And I want to say, and, and in response to this, Job replies to her in a way that I think is often misinterpreted as being more harsh than it is. He, what he says to her is, uh, now you're speaking, he says to her, now you're speaking like a foolish woman. Will we accept only good things from God and not adversity? And I think this has been kind of misread by some as like, he's like chastising her, like you stupid you know, are you stupid woman? You know, how dare you say that about God? Or how dare you tell me to do that? But I don't think that's actually not there in the text. And I don't think that that's the tone actually, it just, it's just my own opinion, but I actually don't think that's the tone in which this idea is delivered. I think what he's, I think what Job is trying to do is he's just trying to, he's trying so hard to hold it together, right? And you know how it is like when you're trying so hard to hold it together and the other person's been there with you, but then like they kind of falter and they're like, nah, you know, this is hopeless or it's not going to work out or whatever. And, and, and then, and then you're like, oh, come on, you know, don't, don't, don't speak that way. We got, we got to, we've got to, we got to deal with this. Right. And so that's what Job says. He doesn't say like you stupid, whatever you stupid woman. He says, you are speaking like a foolish woman would. So first of all, there's not some like outright attack there, like, oh, stupid woman. And he's saying foolish in the sense of, of, of like, that's going to get us nowhere. And then he says, should we accept from God only good things and not adversity? As if to say, even as awful as things are, and look, he had lost all of his children and all of his wealth and his body was falling apart. So it's not like he's just shrugging it off and he's like, hey, you know, it could be worse, whatever, it's not that bad. No, it's like as bad as it could get. 
But he's just saying that given the choice between, between complete negation and resignation and giving up, that and continuing to hold out some faith that, that despite all of this evidence and science to the contrary, that there is still an ultimate meaning here or an, and, and an ultimate resolution and an ultimate some kind of redemption or whatever. Given that choice, he's going to go with a sort of the Pascalian wager, right, of, of trying to cling to that. Now, apart from whether or not that makes sense, and I know there are some people, you know, particularly atheists or, or, or those believe, or who might believe that God doesn't care about the world or is not engaged in any way with things or whatever, sort of a deist view, I know people would look at this idea of like of like choosing faith or choosing meaning or choosing optimism versus the idea of resignation. I know some of them might look at that idea as being very naive, right? Oh, okay, so you're just gonna you're just gonna believe you're just gonna have faith that there's some ultimate meaning or whatever. Why not be cynical? Why 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 not be realistic? But the truth is, as I've talked about before in some of my videos on spirituality and God and stuff. Because neither atheist nor uh, theist nor people who believe in God, and I'm just speaking generally, right? I'm not talking about Christian God or whatever, but just generally people who believe in God. Neither the believers nor the atheist can prove their position scientifically or in, with any sort of objective evidence, right? They have arguments, they have, you know, suppositions, they have hypotheses and theories and observations, but there's just no way to prove it. And so what we are all left with then is a kind of a Pascalian wager of, okay, is it more profitable to us or is it uh, more, what's the term, more potentially meaningful or even a potentially bigger payoff to, to believe in something or to not? And so what Job, I think, is doing here is he's not saying to his wife, like, oh, you stupid, right? He's saying, you know, because he understands she's just lost all these kids. She's lost all her children. There's no way in hell Job is looking at her with judgment. He's like, if he's, listen, let me say this. If Job is as good a man, and I'm just speaking within the terms of the story, right? But if Job is as good a man as he is, as he is described by God and even by God's, ad, by the adversary as being, then there's no way that he was screaming at his wife or looking at her with any kind of condescension or any kind of anger or, or misunderstanding. He totally understood where she was coming from. I think that what he was doing is pleading with her. I think that what he's doing is saying almost like, oh, no, no, not you too. I mean, I've already got all these friends against me telling me, you know, that it's my fault or whatever. And now you're saying just to, to give up, you know, so, you know. And so I think that, you know, that's just one thing I'm going to say. It's interesting. And I, I think it's interesting that the to my knowledge, this quote by Job's wife, curse God and die. To my knowledge, this is the strongest statement against God in the entire Bible uttered by anyone. I was trying to think, you know, I've, I've, I read the whole Bible once and I've read a lot of it twice. I'm not, you know, there's nothing like to brag about or whatever, but just as a part of growing up so much in the church and as a believer, um, I, uh, I read the Bible a lot, and there are certainly places where people get pissed off at God. You know, like Jonah. You know, Jonah was really pissed off at God in, in, in a number of ways. Um, you know, you have you have the story that I've talked about on my channel before about Jacob wrestling with God. It's a really, like, beautiful story. And one of the things I talk about there is that actually the name Israel, you know, it, just according to the, the, the biblical text, right, the Hebrew Bible, Israel was God's chosen people. I'm not trying to get into a debate about anything, all right? But I'm saying that it's interesting that the name Israel actually means he who struggles with God or to struggle with God. Because we think about, and this is something I talked about in one of my other videos. You can look it up and find it. But we think about, uh, we think about religious experience or faith or spiritual belief or whatever as a kind of always a kind of a peacefulness, right? I'm at peace, you know, in the Lord. And I, I mean, I think that is right. But also the fact that uh, in, in the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, God's chosen people, they're, they're Israel. They are known as he who struggles with God or those who struggle with God. To me, that shows that actually a really significant intrinsic part of any kind of, uh, of religious or spiritual uh, experience or relationship with a higher power often involves a kind of a struggling. Why is this going on? This doesn't make sense. How can this be, right? And you find it in some great works of art, you know, whether we're talking about the Coen Brothers, A Serious Man, I love that film, or you're talking about um, 
Are you talking about uh, the Terrence Malick movie, Tree of Life? You know, I know it kind of tests the audience at, at times, but uh, I like that movie a lot. I think that gets at it a lot. It has quotes from Job in, in the movie. Anyway, my point with Job's wife is that there, there are places in the Bible, certainly where many places where people reject God or where people, you know, persecute God's people or people insult, you know, Christ or whatever. But I just can't think of a, of a single place in the Bible, and someone can prove me wrong, but, but there aren't many if there are more than this. I can't think of a single other place in the Bible where someone just, fat, just flat out emphatically says this as a recommendation. And it's not an evil woman, right? I'm assuming if she was with Job, she was probably a very good woman too, right? So she's saying basically, God, you know, and die. Game over and just, I mean, basically complete rejection. Now, what am I getting at? What's the significance of that? What I'm getting at here, well, is a couple of things. First of all, it is significant to me that the person who utters this, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. You have to understand that within the context of, jo of, of this story, when Job goes through all of his suffering, a bunch of his friends show up, okay? And in fact, a lot of the book of Job, you wanna know what a lot of the book of Job is? It's his friends telling him why it's all his fault and criticizing him and getting on his case. His friends show up supposedly to help him or to show their support, I think in some kind of narcissistic sense, honestly, but maybe they, gen they genuinely care, I don't know. Um, but they show up to show, to show support, but then it basically turns into them just saying like, well, this had to be your fault and, uh, and giving him a hard time and criticizing him, no comfort at all, to the point where God later chastises the friends. But you know who God does not chastise? God does not chastise Job's wife, even though Job's wife was the only one who was saying, screw God. The friends were not. The friends were saying, well, God is just and God is good and God is rational and God is righteous. And so if, if you're having a bad time, if God's punishing you, it must be because you did something wrong. Whereas the wife says, nah, you're not doing anything wrong. This is his fault curse him and die. And yet God does not rebuke her. God rebukes the friends. And I think that's because, first of all, these kinds of sentiments are okay. <laughs> I think it's actually, again, this is a very sophisticated book of the Bible. And it's, it's trying to grapple with these, with these issues more deeply. And so when she says, and so when she says this, I mean, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that the writer of this or whoever wrote this, and it might have been a couple of different, multiple people, but anyway, that's another story. But I don't think that the writer of this was putting her in there, you know, in in such a way to um, to make it seem like like she was evil or terrible or that th this was a this was a wrong way to approach suffering or whatever. I think it was put in there to kind of to highlight it as a very natural, understandable response. And it's interesting that God does not chastise her when he, ch when he chastises the friends eventually. And it's also interesting to me that this comes out of the mouth of his wife because, you know, <laughs> not always in the Bible or whatever, but we, but, but they're, you know, we tend to see women in a more sort of subservient position or sort of more following their husband's lead. Not always. I know there's, there's lots of exceptions, but like, this is a woman who's like really assertive. This is a woman who's confident in her intellectual assessment of things. She's not like, well, sweetie, you know, this is, I just don't understand this and it sucks and everything. And I don't know what we're going to do or, you know, whatever. Like this is someone who's like, looks around this and says, screw this. I don't deserve this. This makes no sense. And then asserts that she's not even scared of God at this point. You know, curse God and die. I just think that there's something really interesting about that, that it comes out this kind of ultimate, like, you know, defiance here is coming out of a, of a female mouth. And I know people would say, well, women are actually demonized throughout at times throughout the, uh, the, at least the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament at times, you know, well, there's lots of women depicted lots of different ways. And I don't really like to get into that, that game because actually there are entire books of the Bible, you know, like with uh, Esther, for instance, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament devoted to the strength and uh, the intelligence and the conf and, and, 
and the sing and the spirituality of women. And of course, and then when we see that expanded a lot in the in the New Testament, right, um, with the prominent role, the really shockingly prominent role that women have in the, in the gospel stories and with their relationships uh, to Jesus. But circling back. I just think it is really interesting that this comes out of her mouth and this comes out of the mouth of his wife. And I think one of the things that we see here too is a really interesting um, depiction of the kind of uh, commiseration and the kind of the kind of emotional nourishment that that we find through intimate relationships and intimate romantic relationships, you know, whether it's uh, marriage or, you know, something like that, whatever. The fact that all of his friends turned on him and couldn't really be with him in his suffering, and yet his wife was so with him in his suffering that she was willing to say the, the thing that he couldn't even really let into his mind, right? She sort of says it for both of them. And I, I guess what I'm saying to that is, I, I guess this is just to me a sort of an interesting, what we get in the book of Job also is a sort of interesting depiction of, of, um, of the value of, uh, of committed romantic relationships and of, of you know, what, what we get out of, out of pair bonding and what we get out of committing to someone, you know, in, in sickness and in health, as people like to say, is that in this story, everything else has fallen down around him and he's falling apart and all of his friends, it turns out, you know, they're not really great friends. <laughs> they're not friends to him at all. They're making him feel worse. They're blaming him. And his wife is like, I'm right there with you. You know, this sucks. This is horrible. You don't deserve this. And I actually think that that's also what's being expressed when she says, curse God and die. I don't think she's just, I don't, I don't think she's actually saying give up. I think I read it as like she's commiserating with him to sort of the fullest degree that someone can commiserate. So I don't know. I just think that's really interesting. Now, to get to to get to the end of the story. So so here's what happens is that you know, Job addresses all of these questions to God and, and his friends chastise him and, and so forth. And finally, God appears and God answers. Now, it says that God appears in a, a storm or in a whirlwind. So the idea here is the idea that there, there's like this tornado that appears and that and that God is sort of somehow in it or speaking through it or, or whatever. Right. It's sort of like in the the in the. Um, the story in Exodus, you know, the story of Moses where there's the burning bush and God's talking to him through it, right? It, always, it doesn't always have to make perfect sense. And it's interesting because God really kind of answers him in an asshole way. <laughs> he doesn't say, um, he doesn't actually explain what he's done. He does not address this, this ultimate question of like the theodicy or like what is the meaning of this pointless suffering or why are you afflicting me, Lord, or why is life so difficult or what have I done or any of these things. He doesn't address any of that. What he does, God, is he says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? What is the way to the abode of light and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? This is an interesting question. What kind of a response is this? It seems on its face like a really sort of asshole response. Is this really what we are meant to take from this text? That God, seemingly insensible to our suffering, seemingly not showing concern or not saying, oh, gee, I see what you're going through, or I know that hurts, or I know it's awful, or I know you don't deserve that, or there is a reason, let me explain it to you. And he doesn't do any of that. He says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? And then... And then he describes these other things, these, these things that he's done, you know, creating the earth and creating these creatures and animals and all of this stuff. And he says, as if to say, basically, like, there's no way you can fathom what I'm doing. And I don't even owe you an explanation. Now, that's, that's sort of the initial impression, right? There's, there's no way to get out of the initial impression that, that this is some kind of, like, a, sort of asshole response by God. But is there more to it? Is there something deeper? 
And I, I think that there is, and I'm, of course, I'm not alone in this. There, you know, all kinds of scholars have spent all kinds of time, you know, and, and writers and great thinkers and everything trying to dissect everything in this, right? But I'm just saying the way that it strikes me, I think that as we read through it, there's something deeper going on. And I just want to point out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the rest of this lecture uh, sometime today. I'm about to do a live stream, so I'm going to have to get off, but I'm going to finish this lecture and put it on my Patreon about Job. But, um, and also I'm going to record like a short video maybe where I, I sort of summer, I, I continue this thought, right? So I'm going to put some of this on Patreon and then I'm going to also at some point in the next few weeks put up another uh, video on this topic where, where I talk about a shorter video where I talk about God's reply to Job in this text and, and what I think it, it means more deeply. But I want to point out one thing. In Job 38.19, Chapter 19, verse, uh, chapter uh, 38, verse 19, he says, what God says to Job, what is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Now, this might seem, okay, stick with me here. And, and if you've if you've if you've watched some of my other philosophy videos, you might have an idea of, of where I'm going because I, I tend to go back to the same place a lot, right? The idea of uh, the the paradox or the mystery of uh, of dichotomy or dialectics, and I I'll talk about this in another video. And I've talked about it in some of my other videos, so check them out if you want my philosophy uh, playlist. Anyway, why is it that? when God is, is speaking to Job, why is it that so much, this is a really peculiar passage, why is it that so much pro emphasis is put on this notion of the abode of light? So he says, what is the way to the abode of light? In other words, what he's saying is, where do you locate, where, where does light live? And I don't think that light here is just, I don't think that he's just being, um, that the text is just being literal here as in like visual light, but I, it's talking here also about the deeper like moral and ethical light. Like when we talk about good versus evil or light versus dark, that sort of thing, right? He says, where is light located? Now that seems like a strange, a strange question. He's asking Job. He says, okay, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where, where were you when I created everything? And also, can you tell me where, where light is located? And then he says, and tell me where darkness resides. So tell me where light and darkness are located. Now, what is up with these physical, um, these, these physical terms, where the abode of light, like the home of light, where it resides, where darkness resides, this idea of locationality, right? What is up with that? And then he says, can you take them, meaning can you take the light and the darkness, can you take them to their places? In other words, can you separate them? Do you know where they are? Locationally, do you know where they are? And can you separate them? And then he says, do you know the path to their dwellings? Now, what is up with this locationality, this emphasis on light and dark? And do you know where they live? And can you separate them and all? What is up with that? So random, but it's not. Because as I've talked about on my channel before, okay, if we go back to the story of Genesis, and again, I'm not saying these things literally, okay? These really things really happened. <laughs> But we go back to the story of Genesis, right? God creates, and I've talked about this before in my videos, check it out, but God creates this perfect place, Garden of Eden, he creates earth. What's the first thing he does? What's the first act of creation? The first act of creation is, se is separating light from dark. And God's, and there was darkness, and God said, let there be light. Separates these two. That is the initial act of creation. Isn't that interesting? That the initial act of, of creation is differentiation between two opposites. Then he creates this perfect place and he says to them, you can have anything you want, do anything you want. I'm talking to Adam and Eve. He says, he says, you can have anything you want, do anything you want or whatever. But, but there's one thing you can't do. You can't eat from the tree of knowledge. And so of course, you know, so another dichotomy is created. You can do everything you want in this perfect place, but there's this one thing you can't do, right? And, 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 and so, of course, what do they do? <laughs> they do what they were always intended to do, you know? It was no, you know, if, if God is the God that, that, that we, that, 
if a God of Genesis is the God that we see throughout the Bible, right? This is someone who is all knowing and all powerful and knows what's going to happen before it happens. He, he knows that putting that tree there and telling them that, that they're going to do it. And so what I'm trying to say to you is, is that I really think that in the Bible and the biblical story here, that evil and suffering are not glitches in the system. Okay. They were, they, they're part of the design according to these stories I'm saying. And so God was implanting evil and suffering. It was creating the possibility for that, knowing it would come to pass. So that evil and suffering, ultimately, ultimately everything, even Lucifer created by, was created by God, right? Ultimately, God is everything. This gets back to the, you know, the Eastern idea of the yin and yang. And yet, at the same time that God is everything, we still understand that there is a difference between doing good and doing evil. We still understand on a basic level of conscience, if nothing else, and hopefully logic, but conscience, that someone who helps another person, that activity is far preferable to someone who hurts another person, right? Now, we can't always agree on the ethics of it. We can't always agree on what's appropriate when or, or how to interpret certain things. But I'm just saying as a general understanding, we get that, right? And so even as we understand, you know, all of these things to be a part of the whole, and even as the Bible understands everything to have come from God, the yin and yang, all contained within the circle, there is also the paradox of the, differen the differentiation, whereby we are supposed to be striving toward good and away from evil and redeemed, you know, if, if you buy the Christian story, redeemed by Christ to go toward the light and to go away from the dark. And again, I'm not, if you've seen my videos before, you know that uh, I don't know what I believe spiritually and, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to preach Christianity or whatever. I'm just trying to say there's some interesting stuff going on here. So in Job, when God says, what is the way to the abode of light and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the, do you know the paths to their dwellings? It is an indication that far from evading the ultimate topic of, of, Job's, uh, of Job's angst and disquiet and pain and the ultimate thing that Job is trying to ask, like, okay, if everything is good, if you are good, then how can there be evil? Or if I'm being good, if I, if I built a life of good, how can there still be suffering, right? Trying to figure out that dichotomy, that paradox of, of good and evil, light and dark. And what, and what God is saying here, he's, he's phrasing it is, is, is as sort of throwing it back at Job and pointing out, well, you know, you don't know these things, but he's also acknowledging the ultimate question, the ultimate paradox, you know, where does darkness reside? Because wait, we're not used to thinking that darkness resides in God. And yet what the story of Job shows us is that God authorizes darkness. Darkness comes from him. It is an, it could be an agent of his. And yet, there's also the paradox then of understanding, though, that ultimately God doesn't want a world filled with darkness, or we should be striving to get away from that, or, or Christ redeemed, you know, Christians from that, whatever. So there's this paradox. And so I, I'm going to talk on this more in an upcoming video, and like I said, more on Patreon as well. But I just think that it's really interesting there, and that's not something that you see commented on very much. And that's a, it's a deeply philosophical concept, right? the dichotomy of, of, of the fact that you can have these oppositions, you know, light and dark and good and evil and all these things that don't fit. It's this, it's this jagged juxtaposition, and yet they are all part of the whole. And that's not just a, a, a conundrum or paradox in Christianity. It's a conundrum and a paradox in, well, really like any kind of uh, deeply sustained thought on the subject. And a lot of philosophy has gone toward trying to figure out the sort of duality or dichotomy of life and how to even categorize experiences. Okay, so if you enjoyed this, I've got a lot more on my philosophy playlist. I think it's, uh, I think it's marked uh, philo psychology, philosophy, my life, something like that. Uh, check it out. I've got a lot of videos. This is the stuff that a lot of people like. And uh, I'm going to be delving a little more into Job, but I'm going to get into other things, some film. I want to start talking about some movies. And also, I've got a book club on Patreon I'm trying to resurrect where we will talk about um, some, a bunch of things, uh, hopefully, soon in more depth. Okay, if you enjoyed this, you know... I don't, uh, I don't make really any money from these things and they don't, uh, these types of videos and they don't uh, sell well or play well or get viewed very much, as I've said. So if you enjoyed this, I appreciate uh, your tips below. Pay PayPal, Patreon are great. And uh, yeah, everybody have a good, have a good night.